Hello, and welcome to the Black Ponder. I'm Neil Trotter, the host of the show. And today, we're going to dive into, I guess, modern, contemporary uh, Marxist-Leninism. <laughs> That's right, some anti-capitalist uh, political theory. That's what we're going to do that. We're going to do that via uh, an examination of this text. <laughs> it's called um, On Necrocapitalism, a Plague Journal. And it's by M.I. Asthma. <laughs> right. Now, let me get a good shot here. Okay, that's great. That's good. Look. Cool. Now, who is M.I. Asthma? That's just a, a pseudonym, right? It's Miasma. <laughs> it's a, it's a um, you know, a, a name for a group of authors who have published a, a, a blog and it was like a, a blog that they shared and they posted uh, various anti-capitalist um, uh, points of view and political analysis um, about the pandemic like while it was raging right um, and the idea is uh, they, they, you know, they use the term necrocapitalism because it is to infer the me the meaning which you know capitalism is relies on death, right? which um, yeah you know fair fair uh, critical analysis <laughs> it um, you know a, a large part of capitalism um, requires like death to perpetuate itself. That's that's um, you know the a large part of the, the argument that these authors are making um, and it's it's yeah that's it, it that is true um, I would I would agree with the particularly like you know late what they call late stage capitalism capitalism to like the extreme extent um, but the, you know I'll be honest with you there's just some things I don't I don't vibe with Marxist Leninism and we're gonna talk about that we're gonna talk about that um, I work with several Marxist-Leninist groups and anti-capitalist groups, and you know, for the most part, I would say, uh, yeah, I'm a pretty much an anti-capitalist. <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't frame capitalism as much as a boogeyman as a lot of that that political philosophy does. But definitely, like, there's large problems that happen in our society due to uh, capitalism. And, yeah, we can talk about that. We can talk about that. Uh, I'm, I'm part of a, a, a book club where we were reading Marxist Leninist texts. And so that's that was one of the texts right here. And uh, so I work with uh, Marxist Leninists and um, anti capitalists um, in my activism work. And this is, and that's the primary where I primarily am looking at this text from, like the point of view of activism, uh, particularly activist organizing. And yeah, so that's my point of view. And yeah, so from there, we're, what we're gonna do is what we always do at the Black Ponder: we read text, uh, we read the text as in a book, and then we give some supplementary uh, commentary. You know, that's how I roll here at the Black Ponder. So let's begin, let's begin. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I want to highlight is something that I think it's very insightful that the book brings up is this concept of capitalist imaginary. Let's talk about that, capitalist imaginary. Okay, this is chapter one, you know, in case you got the, the book. <laughs> I got a printed version of it. <laughs> so I can't give you page numbers, I can only give you like, the. Uh, of the chapter so mm -hmm. because the page numbers are all over the place so oh, let me read you here it is uh, this is a quote that I picked it is to speak of a capitalist imaginary is to speak of the way in which ideological norms permeate the way we think the way we are operationalized to think the default mode of thinking and imagining the world in our in our relationship to the world Therefore, a particular capitalist imaginary results from this end of his story narrative, and this imaginary leads to a closure of thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, we <laughs> that's that's spot on, right? Because we live in this capitalist society where capitalism is considered like the end all, be all of the like 
<laughs> the ultimate epitome of mankind, you know, the invention of the corporation, the way we operate business and money, like, yeah, you know, um, this is how human beings are supposed to live. And it, so it's very difficult for us to wrap our minds around anything outside of that framework. <laughs> and then when you start like talking about things that are outside that framework, such as socialist ideas or, you know, alternative um, political philosophies, um, it's hard for uh, people to wrap your, their minds around it, right? Because uh, we have been conditioned, <laughs> right, since birth to accept this, kind of, this whole capitalistic framework, right? And this is important to understand uh, as we move forward. This is a key um, idea that we'll be returning to. Let me skip down a sentence. Uh, the result of accepting this imaginary that capitalism is the only order of reality is an erosion of critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're not, <laughs> you know, it's funny because I just did a, um, a, a live stream on that topic, critical thinking. And part of critical thinking is um, analyzing different points of views against your own or, or different alternative ways of coming to a conclusion. So there's the capitalist conclusion, but what about other ways of doing things like socialist or like Marxist or like an anarchist point of view or like, you know, feminist point of view. It's like, and so when people bring those up, you know, society at large rejects those ideas or it's like, well, that's kind of crazy or that's very deviant, right? But it's, when we don't really take the time to really think critically about these alternative ideas, right? And the capitalist imaginary shuts down that kind of thinking. And, you know, I'm in line with that, that's, that, that makes sense to me. And then I skip down several lines. The way of thinking produced by a concerted anti-communist ideology is so powerful, commands such as a power over the imagination, that one can accept it while also seeing right through it. And so what that sentence is talking about is like we, we see the flaws that capitalism brings about. Right? Um, the exploitation, the extreme exploitation of people, um, you know, the, the suffering that capitalism caused just due to the massive explo exploitation of people, working people to the bone, uh, people working overtime without you know, adequate pay, you know, just abusing laborers, right? And we're like, well, you know, that's just how the system works. You know, if you don't like it, then you need to move up in the company or like, you know, get a better job. Or <laughs> you know, we make these excuses, society. And it's like, well, maybe it's the system in and of itself is bad. right? And maybe we can make a better system. And then the thing is, well, let's not talk about that. Right? That's not even in part of the question. So it's interesting because it's true. Like we accept the ideology full sale. And then even when we're think, we, we see the flaws in the system, we're like, oh, you know, I mean, it's just the flaw of the system, but we still can't create another system, <laughs> but we can, right? But that's that, the type of closure to critical thinking that the capitalist imaginary brings about. And then I skip down like a page. Um, today, capitalism has not only decided that it is the historical point of departure, it is also the point of destiny, right? When I brought up the idea like, oh, you know, capitalism is the epitome of human <laughs> uh, evolution, right? Or human, of human civilization, right? Uh, which it doesn't have to be. And it, you know, I would argue it shouldn't be. <laughs> uh, but this is how we, society at large, not only thinks, but it, it conditions you to think, right? Its imagination is total. It is the past, the present, and future. It is inescapable. We encounter this doctrine in school, at work, and especially in the cultural sphere. The doctrine that capitalism is all of reality is imminent. Born or reassembled as subjects in this phase of triumphant capitalism, our imagination is overdetermined by the uh, facticity of capitalist to totalization. Capitalism is a machine that thinks only according to the subjects assembled under 
its ideological order, generated by its persistence and mutations. It thinks because we think it. It persists because we persist with it. And the ruling ideas of the class and command become all the more compelling for the exploited and oppressed masses who are socialized to imagine there is no alternative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that, that's another key idea, right? Um, you know, there's this focus, capitalism is the enemy and capitalism is what's destroying us. Uh, but capitalism exists only because uh, we, we think it should exist. <laughs> so it's more, it's a, it's a mental thing, right? Of course, it's systemic and it's institutionalized, but it's because, um, you know, it, we are, are locked into this frame of thinking. And that's why I always say, like, philosophy is important. <laughs> because and in that way we, we we can break out of this frame of thinking because ultimately that's what it is right um, capitalism in and of itself uh, is only the problem because uh, we make it the problem right? <laughs> because we're not thinking of other ways of doing things right which is this book argues why how capitalism su succeeds and persists right so allow me to like offer some alternative points of view through the, this book right? and maybe we can break out of that cycle probably not <laughs> what is this little video gonna do but you know let's discuss so this is chapter four uh, one way to spell this out for the space of philosophy is to insist on philosophical reflections that help us think through meanings not given by the same limited and fatal imagination that has made crisis and death an ordinary feature of the world for most people. That's exactly. We're using philosophy to break out of our current ways of thinking into new ways of thinking, right? We're breaking out of one imaginary to, into other imaginaries. Right. Uh, and this is how we can use philosophy uh, constructively, right? Rather than just being locked into a single kind of uh, philosophical framework, right? And the book argues, well, that's what capitalism does, right? It locks you in. So when you start thinking of alternatives, uh, you think they're nuts, crazy, insane, but really they're just alternative points of view. <laughs> and and that, that's how critical thinking is um, handicapped. And this is chapter five. If philosophy is to have any value in moments like this, it must go beyond providing analytical clarity. It must point us in an actionable direction such that the clarity it offers might inform and refine political action. I mean, that is, you know, basically like, I mean, the whole point of the Black Ponder, I, I wholeheartedly agree, agree with that, you know, and I do feel like, a large part of the field of philosophy is stuck in analytic clarity and it doesn't go beyond that <laughs> at a certain point okay now that we've analyzed the situation what are we going to do and how are we going to act and act in ways that um, manifest in political action right and a lot of people don't like political action they're like you know i don't talk about politics i don't get into politics but the fact of the matter is politics are what rule our lives right and you think you can well if i just separate myself from politics then i won't be affected well that's actually not true right? <laughs> politics affects everyone on various degrees uh, and so, it, it, so since it has this all-encompassing effect, why don't we um, engage in politics in a, a way that's like most constructive, <laughs> right? And, and so like, I, I feel like philosophy is a great way to do that. But you can't get locked into the, just analyzing all day, right? And I, you know, I'm bringing this up because it's important for the further discussion that we're gonna have about like where I feel this this text kind of veers off. Um, it brings up good points, <laughs> but then it kind of veers off a little bit in terms of like actionable uh, direction um, to refine political action. Okay, so bear with me here. I'm gonna read you this. As communists, because again, this is primarily a Marxist-Leninist text, so, you know, communists, right? 
a particular flavor of communism. Right? <laughs> Marxist Leninism is a specific flavor of communism. There are other kinds of communism, but Marxist Leninism, communism is the ultimate goal, right? So as communists, we must offer a different approach. Okay, we cannot simply understand the crisis at hand as one of inequality. Okay, instead we must wrestle with the economic reality of the crisis. We must recognize that failed state responses have been a result of capitalist forms of governance that ensure the continued functioning of capitalist economies at the cost of worker safety. We just mentioned that. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm down with that. We must emphasize that imperialism as a global order has exacerbated this crisis at the cost of the working class the world over. Mm -hmm. Capitalism does have that effect. And I skip down a few lines. We must emerge from this crisis not with a revived liberal humanism and commitment to inequality, but with a sense of proletarian solidarity that seeks to do away with the economic base that produces inequality in the first place. Mm hmm Right. Okay, so... <laughs> Right. All right. But the, the question then becomes, OK, how are so how are you going to do that? Like how? <laughs> how are you going to do away with economic base that produces inequality in the first place? Like in what way are you going to do that? You're going to build a sense of pro proletarian solidarity. Right. How are you going to build a sense of proletarian um, solidarity? Right. How? <laughs> and that's that's important because <laughs> what we're saying, actionable direction, right? Not just direction, <laughs> right? But actionable direction, <laughs> right? So I think the, but here the, the book does outline some ways, but then it kind of veers away from those ways, right? So let me keep going. And this is chapter nine. Okay, they're talking about you now slogans. All right, that's on slogans is the name of the chapter. Okay, so the slogan defund the police, quote unquote, resonates in a way that these others do not, you know. And they bring up a bunch, um, all cops are bastards, <laughs> um, a cap, um, several they bring up. Right, and one of them is, is so they're focusing on defund the police, okay? That resonates where others do not. It is a forceful and time it is forceful and timely. It crystallizes popular resentment and it has caught on. The slogan now inspires countless social media discussions, memes, even mainstream think pieces. Most importantly, defund the police indicates a concrete policy measure through radical though radical when measured against increasingly militarized police forces worldwide, it is at least conceivable. After all, having, haven't neoliberal policies just been one long series of public defundings? Uh, in a way that the more radical, the more radical but long-term ideologically correct slogan, abolish the police is not. The real proof is in the concrete political initiatives the slogan is driving and that are driving the slogan, such as the Minneapolis City uh, Council pledge to defund and dismantle the police force. Okay, all right. So, uh, key, key there, defund the police. Um, I'm an abolitionist, by the way. That's kind of where I identify in, in uh, my politics. So, I'm all about abolish the police <laughs> and I'd made some, a few videos about that topic um, you know check it out at your leisure it's interesting because the book is saying like uh, the more radical and ideologically correct is abolish the police but uh, I almost dropped my book there <laughs> but uh, the defund the police is the more like actionable or like more realistic way to do political action right, is what the book kind of frames this as and, and I'll continue here uh, defund the police should be spread far and wide at this particular moment since there is a great opportunity to radicalize the exhausted everyday folks who are as yet too afraid to dream of abolition 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Too afraid to dream of abolition. Okay, but then it goes on to say, watch out for its co-optation and be ready to shift gears. The problem is inherent in the fact that defunding implies the continued existence of the state whose existence the cops are there to protect. If we're going to defund, let's take the struggle further and not miss the opportunity to wrestle our public institutions out of the hands of capitalist cronies whose property regime breathes terrible life into the police terrorizing our communities and making us all unsafe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm kind of, I'm with you there. Uh, but what I want to introduce you to, because I, some of my Marx, Marxist Leninist friends have introduced me to like some of the philosophy of Marxist Leninism, right? And there's this concept is called, uh, you may know it already. Is I think it, it one phrase it's referred to as is from the masses to the masses right from the masses to the masses that's a, is a way of organi uh, organizing <clears throat> excuse me and there's different variations of this I know anarchists they um, is, a, is a bit different and it's they call it like praxis but it's not exactly the same but from the masses to the masses is this idea is like okay the people who are organizers, the organizers, you know, the vanguard, <laughs> the organizers will develop like a, a method to organize the masses and do activism, right? Then they'll take that to the masses, right? And then the masses will be like, whoa, 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 whoa. this is this is too, this is too much, or this is not enough, or um, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that, and so then. Um, the vanguard or the organizers will take the, con the the way of organizing, they'll rework it to make it more suitable for the masses, right? <laughs> and then they'll come back to the masses like, okay, we're going to organize and we're going to do our political action in this way, right? Um, is this cool or what's going on? Like, And then the masses will, you know, the most of the proletariat or the working class will be like, okay, we're gonna do this, but that's a little too much for us. And, or like, that's not enough. And you need to do this and you need to do that. And then it's like, okay, we're gonna come back. <laughs> we're gonna revamp and redo and update. And then we're gonna, okay, now what the how, how about this way of organizing? And, and so this, in this way, it, it, it's a way to make sure that your, the organizing practice is aligned with the masses, what the masses want, right? Because that's the, the idea of Marxist-Leninism is this dictatorship of the pro proletariat. <laughs> it's the masses, the working class rules. So we gotta listen to the working class. But I mean, the question, and this is where I kind of veer away, where it's like, uh, but the working class is, is locked into the capitalist imaginary. Are they not? Um, and then, so what is the working class? That's that's a kind of issue I take with Marxist Leninism. The working class is not this monolith that has this like <laughs> uniform idea of how things should go, right? And and so they would. The idea is like, well, that's why you have a vanguard. But but if you have this idea of masses to the from the masses to the masses, right? You're constantly reworking your your way of strategizing. Which is, you know, that's important to do, but you're relying on um, people in society that are locked into the capitalist imaginary. And so the example would be like, abolish the police. With that idea of from the masses to the masses, you'd take that abolish the police and you'd be like, well, we can't say that because people aren't ready for that. Right? Defund the police is kind of a this intermarriage intermediary that we can use to get to abolish the police right because they're not ready for it yet <laughs> uh, but I would argue like well the reason why they're not ready yet is because they're locked into this capitalist imaginary right which the book brings up and so how do you get people out of that capitalist imaginary you got to be very radical with your ideas and you got to uh, be kind of forefront with them and say like no no actually I do want to abolish the police that's that's my uh, that's my ultimate goal and 
I'm not reworking it. And uh, here, here's my plan. And, you know, and, and so in that way, what's going to happen is people are going to be like, well, what do you mean abolish bill? How is that realistic? Um, how are you going to deal with crime? And then you could like talk to the masses rather than like going back to your vanguard and be like, okay, we got to rework it. Is this good? No, you, you directly organize with the masses, right? but you got to do it in a radical way because then you're breaking out of that imaginary, right? You're allowing the masses the opportunity to think outside of capitalist um, framework, <laughs> right? Uh, and I think that's important, right? But let me continue. Let me continue with some more quotes here. Uh, where were we at? Okay, round six. Okay, this is chapter 11. All right, and first quote. And it's just one sentence here. It is do not deny the risk justify it and contextualize it within broader structures of systemic injustice right because the, here's the thing like the idea is if you're oh, okay if you're too radical then you you pose this risk right and then you're not gonna jive with the masses right uh, but if you're if the masses are locked into a capitalist imaginary <laughs> and your goal is to break out of that imaginary uh, then some sport of some form of risk has to be assumed like yeah not everybody's gonna get it right but some people they might get it right and then the people that might get it might start explaining to other people right like well actually i think this is a good idea or you know maybe these alternatives are are good you know and you're allowing the opportunity to um break out of that framework that that typical framework of thinking and, you know we're using the example of the police and defunding or abolishing the police right that's the example we're using and, and, and so if somebody's just locked into like what are you talking about like we should be funding the police right? uh, or we should be we, the police should exist um, but if you're saying like well what if you what if you had we live in a world where the police didn't exist what would that world look like then you stuff that stuff to start thinking like hmm hmm man i never really thought of that before <laughs> you know i never uh really considered that before i've had these discussions with just random people on the street and a lot of people just don't even think about it it's not it isn't even so much that they're opposed to it um they're opposed to it because they haven't even like thought differently before <laughs> but if you give people the opportunity to think differently they will be like yeah you know you got a point there right uh but the problem is you don't run that risk right that you're like you're just crazy i'm not gonna listen to you you're just some offshoot or just some off ball you don't have my interests in mind i mean that that's the risk right so the risk is not appealing to the masses right but if the masses are already <laughs> um, conditioned to capitalist ways of thinking then you have to start like taking that risk right <laughs> because you gotta like figure out some way of breaking people out of that framework right and that's that's where i'm i'm trying to argue about but we'll, we'll continue we'll continue chapter 13 here uh capitalism possesses a strong purchase on our imagination it is difficult to think outside of its boundaries, even when we know that what lies within its boundaries is utterly necrotic. <laughs> you know, it's, it's related to death. And, you know, as we learn, we're continuing the police example, as we learn more and more about what police actually do, and we see in the police corruption and the, the murders by police, and they're being filmed uh, by due to like social media and everybody's got a phone on there uh, everybody's got like a, a camera on their phone right <laughs> so you know mainstream media doesn't have a lock on that anymore people are beginning to see that and yet they, they're seeing this corruption they're like well you know there are some bad apples right <laughs> but you know we still got to use the police because what else are you going to do <laughs> and that's how strong of a whole the capitalist imaginary has you see in all this uh, 
necrotic <laughs> evidence, like this death um, related instances that our system drives. But, but you're still accepting it. That's why it's very important, I think, to, to do very radical type of things. And I think that gives you the masses the opportunity to break out and be like, huh, I never really thought of that before. <laughs> and that's what it takes. And that's why I'm, I'm a firm pusher in philosophy, but in a, in a way that um, encourages direct action. Um, in the political arena <laughs> right so let me read you this quote is a uh, chapter 17 um, here we go it is tempting in this moment to try to point to the, to the resurgence of mutual aid and other forms of communal organizing as a solution to these problems those who defend a prefigurative approach to politics often argue that we are building the alternative to the nuclear family okay so it's using the nuclear family as an example uh, you know the the husband the wife the mom the dad the 2.5 kids um, the dog the cat the fish in the fishbowl the house with the white picket fence you know that nuclear family right <laughs> but you know i'm saying like that's the mainstream accepted family and other kinds of families are deemed deviant are like othered because of you know the capitalist imaginary right so it's using the nuclear family as an example so alternative to the nuclear family in the here and now and when we create these forms of care that transcend the nuclear family and create a connected and collective sense of mutual responsibility while these forms of organizing may indeed propagandistically call attention to the failures of the nuclear family and its individualized regime of care, they do not replace it or do away with it based merely on their existence. Such, such organizing is crucial, but it is not enough. The capitalist notion of the family, which claims to defend the needs of children while demanding that they die from a horrific virus, the COVID-19 pandemic, so that the economy can keep functioning is built into the very core of ideological understanding understandings of society and is reinforced materially through capitalist social relations okay we need to draw attention to is not only the ways in which current organizing efforts can propagandize a new possible future but also the extent to which truly equitable socialized care that moves beyond the nuclear family and reactionary homophobic ideas about re reproduction is incompatible with capitalist relations more broadly okay capitalism itself has made the possibility of the bourgeois family only available to the few while providing no alternative family structure for the masses leaving them to face impossible decisions in constant states of crisis um yeah that's, that's true but uh, the thing is like um it is important to uh, highlight like okay, okay there's a systematic a systemic drive <laughs> that is pushing us to believe in those things right that that that's the only way of doing things and you can say like yeah that's capitalism so capitalism is ultimately the problem <laughs> uh, but I would say that a mutual aid and um, you know community organizing are solutions in and of themselves because they offer like alternative i mean they, they showcase the example of like look this is how you break out of cap like here's something that's working that isn't capitalist and the book is arguing yeah that, that's what you need to do you gotta like let people know like this is not a capitalist way of thinking but you can't the thing is <laughs> it's kind of like putting the, the cart before the horse right you can't just say like capitalism is is the problem right <laughs> like but but how is capitalism the problem and you could like so it's not you know they saying like such organizing is crucial is is more than crucial like it it, it is how capitalism is, is defeated <laughs> when you do instances of mutual aid and it's like look here's an instance where we uh helped a lot of people I got uh, 
a, a, a sun umbrella up, giving me shade. <laughs> so you probably, where is it? You see it right here. Here's an instance of mutual aid. All right. And it's helping a lot of people. <laughs> uh, notice that uh, we didn't use any type of capitalist, capitalistic framework. Whereas, like, it, we didn't use, there was no nonprofit organizations involved. <laughs> there was no instances of just charity, right? This wasn't like a, a church giving to, an, or a religious institution giving um, this one way aid, right? It was a mutual situation where everybody was involved and everybody received help. Look at this. It, it, so, in that way, this is a successful way of helping each other out right and people will see that people will, you know many people will be like hmm you know that's kind of interesting and it might be the way we should start doing things right <laughs> it's as if the, like the book is <laughs> is insinuating there was no problem with the family only until capitalism came onto the scene and then like that's when the family was became this destructive force when in because it became this nuclear heteronormative patriarchal um, structure <laughs> that's exploitative right but you know there definitely was problems with family <laughs> before <laughs> the creation of capitalism in uh human existence right uh i would argue like but always forms of community organizing and mutual aid provide um, benefit because mutual aid, um, the very definition of mutual aid excludes exploitation, right? Because it's a mutual exchange, right? Rather than uh, simple charity. Our communal organizing in and of itself is a, is anti-capitalist because you're involving the community, right? As opposed to like, organizing that has nothing to do with the community. Maybe it's like some outside entity or something like that. And so it is in that way that these things do attack capitalism. <laughs> because again, it's like you're doing things that allow people to see positive uh, ways of being a human being without like capitalism, <laughs> without the framework of capitalism, right? Uh, it's allowing people to escape the capitalist imaginary as opposed to just like lecturing somebody about the, the woes of capitalism all right insane <laughs> you know which it doesn't isn't like that successful in getting people to think outside of capitalism and its framework <laughs> so there does need to be like this marriage of of theory and practice and i feel like that just doesn't happen Right, it, it, it's not really showcased here in this book, and you know, I, I, I'm kind of left when I talk to my Marxist Leninist friends <laughs> of like, okay, but how are you going to uh, get people to break out of capitalist ways of thinking rather than just theorizing with them? <laughs> right, because not everybody responds to that, but everybody responds to like instances of mutual aid and communal organizing. Again, sometimes the fixation on uh, political theory, even anti-capitalist political theory, um, discourages action. Right? I mean, it, it could happen the other way too, right? And I, I'm seeing it, and that's kind of like my issue with these kinds of political philosophies. But it's interesting because the book does. Um, I say <laughs> action is important, but it's kind of locked into its own imaginary, which is this Marxist Leninism, right? And it's, it's hard to break out into like actionable things, right? Um, and it even says it here, and, and this is chapter 24. I like this, this line right here. The revolutionary imaginary is about demanding the impossible, right? So, <laughs> the thing is, like, if you're if if that that concept from the masses to the masses, you're not demanding the impossible right, when you do that because you demand the impossible. The masses are like, you can't do that. 
And so you, you go back <laughs> and you're like, okay, we need to make something that's a bit more realistic. <laughs> Such as the example of, okay, let's not abolish the police. Let's like defund the police, right? Because people are saying that's impossible. But revolutionary imaginary is about demanding the impossible, right? And you know, they'll say like, well, you need to be realistic, but realistic in what way? Like, where, how are you framing your realism? Like, are you framing, like, because if the masses are telling you what's realistic, they're, they're in that capitalistic, they're in the capitalist imaginary. <laughs> right, right. Most, most of the society is uh, basing their uh, points of views off of capitalism, because capitalism is, is the, the reigning way of life. At least here in the United States of America, but much of the Western world, and honestly, a lot of the Eastern world too, right? Uh, so you kind of have to do escape theory to a certain extent. You got to actually like push the impossible, right? And you, you, and you can't even let the masses say like, well, you got to tone it down a little bit. Like, no, I won't turn it down. Let me show you how. And how do you show them? Through mutual aid and community organizing, right? <laughs> and then people will be like, oh, okay. And I've experienced real examples of this, right? Because I'm a part of a community activist group, and we do provide do a lot of mutual aid events and a lot of community organizing. And people will say, like, "Wow, I never thought that was possible. Like, I didn't know you could do this without paying people." <laughs> and I'm like, "Well, yeah. If, they, if people are get, receiving benefit, right, and it's going both ways, like." Of course, people are gonna want to do it, right? You don't, nobody, you don't have to be on a payroll, right? And so, in that way, people start breaking out of the imaginary. So that's what I'm saying. Like sometimes, mutual aid in and of itself is enough because that allows you to guide people into like anti-capitalist thinking. So let me read you this. This is chapter 23. As happens every four years, we hear constant demands that we fall in line and cast a vote for yet another moderate neoliberal Democrat because the alternative possesses an external threat to the norms of democracy. You know, talking about elections, right? And, you know, neoliberal Democrats like uh, Joe Biden, <laughs> for instance. I got you. I'm, I'm with you there. While it is true that Trump has eroded liberal norms at a particularly, particularly rapid pace, it does not follow from this that a bourgeois electoral strategy would be sufficient to repair the erosion of these norms. Okay, okay. As communists, we understand that the erosion of liberal norms is a result of reactionary defense mechanism that occur within capitalism during moments of particular, particularly distinct crises. Crises. Uh, regardless of whether Trump is an instance of this fascist reaction crisis, we must insist that the conditions that allow the emergence of such a fascist reaction are themselves found within the very conditions that produce the norms and political order of liberal republicanism that the Democrats claim to hold in such high regard. Okay? So it's basically critiquing like, you know, um, liberalism or, you know, what is often called neoliberalism, how people will say like, you know, Republicans are really bad, but Democrats are like just as bad, or they're just falling in line and they're no better than everybody else. So is voting really something that you should do? And I mean, those are good points. Those are good points and they're often true. <laughs> um, liberals, of course, remind, remain blind to this reality and to the extent to which their own politics are inseparably uh, intertwined with the conditions that allow for the emergence of fascism. Thus, we find ourselves endlessly shamed for being unwilling to compromise in the name of practicality or national unity in the face of supposedly unique threat. And so, you know, what the, the, the quote is talking about here is the idea like, you know, you sometimes people get shamed because they don't vote because they believe, well, voting is, is irrelevant, <laughs> right? Um, because you're, you know, the, the idea of picking the lesser of the two evils, it doesn't really exist because both these people that I'm vo either person I'm voting for, uh, will drive society toward a more capitalist and therefore necrotic <laughs> way of existence, right? 
you know, and then it goes on talking about how Trump is this seen as this exception where he's actually just um, a product of this long lineage of capitalism, right? And that's all good and fine. But I'll be honest with you, I'm not really jiving with the whole like, well, we need to like disengage from the system. <laughs> to me, that's like I don't know. But and comment below, let me know how you feel. Because, you know, I could be wrong in this. I've been thinking about this for a while. You know, to me, it's kind of like you, you're a fish and you're in the, the fish tank and you, you, you got the water and the water's messy, right? The water's really messy and it's polluted. And you're like, oh, you know, the hell with this water. I'm just going to jump out the fish bowl. <laughs> right. It's like, well, if you jump out, the, you can't. You know, first of all, you can't jump out the fish bowl, right? Because you need water to survive, right? And, you know, it, it, that's what it's like to me. It's like, you're, you're in it. You're in it. So it's like, uh, and, and that's not to say like, oh, well, I'm, I'm supposed to just accept the, the pollution for what it is. No. You got to do what you can to clean it up the mess. <laughs> you can't just disengage, right? Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that life is, is messy. We live in a, in a, a broken society. It's true. Right, and it, 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 it's not as simple as I'm just gonna disengage or I'm just gonna tell you all the things that are wrong with the system and um, you know, that's good enough. <laughs> it's like, no, you gotta like start acting, you gotta start like cleaning, doing things that clean <laughs> the, system, the, the water if we're using the fish bowl. And what are those things? Things like mutual aid, and community organizing are just you know a few examples voting is uh, a thing you could do too now i'm not saying like i'm not going to guilt trip you if you are somebody who's like oh, i'm not voting because that's just perpetuating the system i don't think it is i think it's just accepting like the reality for what it is it's like look we, it's a messy ass world and so i i'm gonna have to pick a lousy ass person rather than this super duper lousy ass person and you but you know i would say like don't pat yourself on the back for doing that just be like yeah i voted for this super lousy ass person because you know that was they're not going to make the world like as worse as it could be i still gonna be pretty bad right so i need to do more than that right i need to do more than that and i think that does mean something it means like look i'm in it <laughs> and i'm engaged <laughs> right uh this is the water that i'm swimming in right but you know of course like that's not enough it's like okay i voted that's it i disengage no <laughs> you don't do that either you, you you even come to the guy who you voted for and you're like i don't like you the only reason why I voted for you because I just didn't like that other guy who was worse, much worse than you. But you're not good either. Right? You know, you gotta be upfront and like be like blatant about like I'm in the system, right? You can't, you know, I'm not for like just completely disengaging because is that really helpful? Not really. Right? Um, it it's kind of works both ways, right? It kind of works both ways. Where you know you get you do have those neoliberals that are like I'm gonna vote for the lesser of two evils and then I voted for the lesser of two evils I did my duty now let me go back to like watching Desperate Housewives or or whatever right <laughs> or like you know watching uh, Barbie because if I watch Barbie then I'm a feminist right <laughs> you know? so that's bad too I'm not saying that but you know I would say like what's also bad is being like I'm just not gonna vote period. And I'm just not gonna vote, and then I'm just gonna like read Marx texts, um, and I'm gonna debate with people about Marxist texts, and that's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> right? That's not good either, because you're not. Is it not the same in the way? Is it? You know, I, I, to me, it's like you gotta get into it. You gotta get in. You gotta get your hands dirty. It's a mess. Like we we in this mess, and you know to break the system you got to get into the system and i'm not saying you need to like be a politician or something like that or like become like a you know well maybe i should become a, a public servant or like i should be a, a city council member i'm not saying do all that right? i mean if you want to do that i'm not going to knock you either but I, I don't think it's just it's enough to just critique the system 
and then just disengage completely and think you're actually doing something because in that way aren't you kind of the same as the neoliberals i don't i don't know that that's that's me comment below comment below let me know let me hear what you got to say how about return to 24 i went to 20 chapter 24 then I went to 23 now we're back to the chapter 24 and i'll read you this quote which is along the same lines um, although proponents of the bourgeois electoral circus argue that refusing to participate in the, in the spectacle of elections is callous indifference and thus evidence of a nihilistic attitude might it in fact be the opposite okay so there's a response there you know you're you know you're saying i'm an you know i'm a nihilist when you say it like oh you're just disengaged and i'm not saying that i'm just and i'm not also not a proponent of the bourgeoisie electrical circuit <laughs> electoral circus right uh, just because you participate doesn't mean you're a proponent of it right I mean it could just be a simple fact is look I'm, I'm, I'm just in this shit so it's like the, the fish swimming in the fishbowl <laughs> right? it's like I know the water's polluted so I gotta like do what I can to navigate through it I'm not saying it's good I'm just saying like that's what I'm I'm in it and also, you know, let's make it clear. I'm not saying it because if you're like one of those people, who like, look, I don't, I don't vote. Um, that, that you have a right to not vote, <laughs> right? If that's what you don't want to do. Uh, that's fine. I, I just kind of push back at like, yeah, that that's my way of breaking the system. Like, you're not breaking the system when you don't vote, right? <laughs> that's not, you're not doing that. You see, that's where I'm. That's my pro the issue is like, you are you really doing anything when you disengage? No, because people are still gonna vote, and usually the people that are voting are the people the system serves the best, right? So what are you really doing, right? To find meaning in such a concatenation is impossible, and everyone who even thinks about it for more than a few minutes is forced to realize how meaningless it is. We would have to be nihilists regarding everything else about social existence to care about the electoral system. Nothing really matters and nothing will change, but we might as well vote since there is nothing better to do. So that's like the premise, right? Well, I gotta vote because what else am I gonna do? And and so the, the idea is pushed like people who vote they just vote and they they don't do anything else which is definitely true <laughs> like a lot of pe a lot of people do that but i'm saying like vote and then do other things like voting doesn't negate anti-capitalist action if you do anti-capitalist action and are in in the midst of the system the capitalist system too and that's where i kind of like verge away from Marx's let it is, it was like if you're involved in the capitalist system or the electoral system in any way, then you're in support of capitalism. And I'm like, well, I don't know. It's not as simple as that. <laughs> it's not as simple as that. I think it's totally fine to be like, I, I voted for you, but I think you're an asshole. Or like, I voted for you, but I think your politics are extremely horrible. But I'm sure and shit not going to vote for that other guy. Um, <laughs> right? That's that you can totally do that. I think that's more uh, anti-capitalist or anti-institutional uh, than to just not vote and just kind of like go into someone's basement and debate with somebody else about like Marxist theory. Right? <laughs> and then on top of that, like you're you're saying you voted and you don't like the the system, so you go out and you do other things right you go out and you do mutual aid and you're constantly like talking with people and you're like yeah I'm, I, I voted but you know I, I just don't agree with the system right and so I'm gonna do these mutual aid things and I'm gonna show you like why I think we should do we can do better uh, but I'm not gonna completely disengage with the system because we're all in it <laughs> it's like that fish I'm not gonna just jump out the tank and then like drown <laughs> or like no uh, fish don't drown. Right? Your fish uh, die from lack of water. Right? But I guess the metaphor kind of fails at that point because when you jump out of the the system, you're not necessarily in any danger, right? <laughs> See, that's the issue. <laughs> you're not. You're just like completely devolved from the system, and and so like it's very difficult at that point to like actually do things that affect the the negative aspects <laughs> of society because you're like now you're operating from the outside you've kind of abstracted yourself from 
uh, society to that point. So you're limiting what you can do, right? You're in this theory and it's very hard to get back into the, the practical. So it's not like this either or scenario, right? Like if you vote, then you are uh, signing approval for the electoral system. No. Also, like if you don't vote, then you're in that way you're destroying capitalism <laughs> or you're even doing something that's remotely negative to capitalism. You're not doing that too. In fact, that's that's what they want you to do too is not vote, right? They want the, the voting populace to be as small as possible. Hence why they pass so many uh, voting restriction uh, laws here uh, where I'm living, the American South. I'm just saying like, you gotta get messy, you gotta get in the system and you gotta take risks. You gotta, you, you know, the, I think a lot of times people are afraid to get involved in uh, the negative aspects of the system because they're like, I don't want to get tainted. Or like, I don't want, I don't want to be co-opted. It's like, you gotta be strong in your convictions. You gotta believe in yourself, right? And be like, look, this is how I think, this is what I feel, right? And I'm, I'm gonna, gonna go out there and I'm gonna push these ideas. Um, you know, not to the, and you don't wanna like go overboard. Everything could be taken overboard, right? You don't wanna push it to the extent where you're exploiting people, right? Or you're, you're not in touch at all with the masses. You should always have the masses in mind, but you gotta remember, like the book said, there's a capitalist imaginary. I would argue, like, the masses, most of the masses are trapped in the capitalist imaginary. How do you break out of that? You gotta provide alternatives. And you gotta do that through example, through practice. And it isn't just enough to say like, oh, capitalism is bad because this, 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 and that. You can't just say it. You have to, you have to <laughs> speak, you, you gotta show it too. Through, organize, through communal, community organizing and mutual aid. And honestly, I would, I would say like, if you're just doing that, that is a way of, of finding the capitalist system. Is that enough? Uh, you could do more. You can you, you can do those things and then say like, look, what I'm doing here, this isn't capitalism. These are socialist actions, or these are communist actions, or these is, are anarchist action, actions, or are these anti-capitalist actions, or whatever, however you want to frame it. Um, but I think it is that initial, oh, there's somebody out there doing it, and he and that person is in the system. <laughs> he's, he's in it. He's not like separated himself. So, huh. So it is possible. It is possible to like do successful things and helpful things that aren't, <laughs> that have nothing to do with capitalism or patriarchy or other kinds of exploit, exploitative, oppressive, discriminatory ways of doing things. <laughs> That's all I wanted to throw out there. I think this is a, a good book if you want to know about some, um, you know, uh, Marxist-Leninism. I, I think it is. I think I would say it because it, Lenin is quoted a lot in this book. <laughs> so I would definitely say like, yeah, it's Marxist-Leninism. I think some people would be like, well, it's not necessarily Marxist-Leninism. It's more anti-capitalist. Mm, I don't know because Stalin is quoted here. Mao is quoted in there. So those are the big three, right? Stalin, Mao. Lenin, <laughs> in terms of like, and Marx, right, um, and, you know, who are like Marxist Leninists, um, they're all quoted here. So I would say, like, if you want to know some contemporary applications for Marxist Leninist theory, yeah, check that book out. Check that book out. But I, I want to hear your thoughts. Maybe you're a Marxist Leninist or, um, you know, or maybe you also don't jive with Marxist Leninists. I, you know, I, I have friends who are Marxist Leninists and they're cool peeps. But sometimes I think they can get too caught up into the theory and not enough into the action. And I, I sometimes find that they struggle with applying their theory to like real world applications. Uh, <laughs> but let me know, <laughs> let me know. Maybe you see it differently or you can add your two cents if you want, feel free. But anyway, this is the Black Ponder. Tune in next time for more Philosophical Thought.